Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rao's IAS. Do not forget to subscribe to our Telegram channel for all the updates and materials. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today is Sunday and on Sundays, we cover not only the last week's explained section but also today's The Hindu Newspaper. The articles which we are going to cover have been displayed on the screen. And let us now begin the discussion. So the first article which we have taken for discussion has appeared on FAQ page. How will UGC execute the college cluster plan? What are the national education policy recommendations for higher education institutions? And so UGC has issued new guidelines for transforming colleges and universities into multidisciplinary institutions. The guidelines prescribe three approaches which include cluster of institutions located in proximity so that they can collaborate with each other to offer innovative programs in offline, online or distance learning mode. But from the perspective of civil services examination, if you look at the syllabus of GS paper 2, issues relating to development and management of social sector services relating to health, education and human resource is a part of your syllabus. And this is a good opportunity to revisit the national education policies important recommendation. So what we shall do is that we shall first cover the constitutional provisions related to education starting with fundamental rights, directive principle of state policy, fundamental duties and also the section of special directives. Then we will understand the administrative setup as to division of the items related to education sector between union as well as the state. Then we will cover the important provisions of National Education Policy 2020 dealing with the reform of school education, higher education as well as some other announcements which cannot be categorized into school as well as higher education. So let us now begin the discussion. So it is always a good idea to start with constitutional provisions regarding anything related to polity, social issues. You should be well aware of the articles and the provisions dealing with almost anything given in the UPSC syllabus. And since we are discussing education, it is important that we look at various articles and provisions related to education in our constitution. So starting with the fundamental rights. Article 15 talks about prohibition of discrimination on various grounds and this is applicable to educational institutions also which are partially or fully run by the state. And in that if you focus on clause 5 which was inserted by 93rd constitutional amendment, it talks about advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or the citizens from scheduled tribes and scheduled caste sections as far as that advancement deals with their admission to educational institutions including private educational institutions whether aided or unaided by the state other than the minority educational institutions given in article 30. So you can see that although this particular article is focused on advancement of education of a particular classes of citizens but nonetheless they are the ones who have been denied and hence it makes sense. Then of course article 21a which was inserted by 86th constitutional amendment of 2002 which talks about the right to education where the state shall provide free and compulsory education to all children of the age of 6 to 14 years in such manner as the state may by law determine and hence a law was enacted to ensure ground implementation of article 21a. Then article 28 although deals with freedom of religion but it also talks about educational institutions where freedom as to attendance at religious instruction or religious worship in certain educational institutions. Then cultural and educational rights of article 29 and 30 are very important because under clause 2 of article 29 no citizen shall be denied admission into any educational institution maintained by the state or receiving aid of the state funds on the grounds only of religion, race, caste, language or any of them. So these provisions have been included to ensure that no children belonging to a particular group of our society is deprived of education. Similarly, Article 30 gives right to all minorities, whether based on religion or language, to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice. Then we move on to the part 4, which is directive principles of the state policy. In this, Article 45 and Article 46 talk about education. 
Article 45 focuses on early childhood care and education for all children until they complete the age of 6 years. Whereas Article 46 talks about promotion of educational and economic interests of scheduled castes, scheduled tribes and other weaker sections. Then we don't have to forget fundamental duties that is part 4a of our constitution. Where the subsection H talks about development of scientific temper, humanism and spirit of inquiry and reform which directly deals with the education. And then finally the last fundamental duty talks about duties of parents and guardians to provide opportunities for education to his child or as the case may be ward between the age of 6 and 14 years. This was also inserted by 86th constitutional amendment of 2002. Then the next set of instructions related to education has been given in article 350 and 351. So article 350a facilitates or ensures the instruction in mother tongue at primary stage. It calls upon the state to make sure that every local authority within the state provides adequate facilities for instruction in mother tongue at primary stage of education to children belonging to linguistic minority groups. And Article 351 gives directives for development of Hindi language, according to which it shall be the duty of the union to promote the spread of Hindi language. So these were the constitutional provisions with respect to the education. But what about the administrative setup or what about the division of the responsibility between union and state? And as you know that that is decided by the provisions of the 7th schedule. So let's now understand various provisions of the 7th schedule to get a better idea as to whose responsibility it is to educate Indians whether it is state or center or both. So here we are with the 7th schedule. So as you know that there exists a set of universities known by the name of central universities for example Banaras Hindu University, Jawaharlal National University or Aligarh Muslim University. So any institution declared by parliament by law to be an institution of national importance comes under the purview of center and is governed by the provisions of list 1 of schedule 7. Similarly, institutions for scientific or technical education financed by government of India wholly or in part and declared by law to be institution of national importance. For example, IITs, IIMs, Indian Institute of Science Education and Researches, NITs, Indian Institute of Science. So all these institutions come under the umbrella of central institution and they are governed by central government. Similarly, article 65 talks about setting up of agencies by the union government for professional, vocational or technical training including the training of police officers as you know there is a police academy in Hyderabad then it enables the central government to establish and run an institution for the promotion of special studies or research and it does the same for scientific or technical assistance in the investigation or detection of the crimes. And similarly, entry number 66 talks about coordination, determination of standards in institutions for higher education or research and scientific and technical institutions. And for that purpose, you have a lot of organizations, for example, CSIR, UGC, all have been set up and run by central government. So this is it as far as the list one is concerned. So you can see that a very very small subset of overall education comes under the purview of central government or you can say the center which mainly deals with research, higher education, coordination, collaboration and few central universities. And now we move on to the state list where the entry number 12 tangentially talks about education because it gives the powers to the state to set up libraries, museums and other similar institutions controlled and financed by state. But this is the only provisions which directly gives powers to the states as far as education is concerned. And let us now look at the provisions of concurrent lists that is the list 3. Wherein the entry number 25 talks about education including technical education, medical education and universities subject to the provisions of entries 63, 64, 65 and 66 of list 1 which we have already discussed as well as vocational and technical training of labor. So power dealing with education has been given both to center as well as the state. Similarly entry number 26 talks about legal, medical and other professions. So according to this both center as well as state government can take necessary steps for development of legal field, health field as well as other professional fields. So we saw that list 1, which is also the union list, demarcates the exclusive responsibility of the center government. Similarly, list 2, which is a state list, specified the functions and responsibility which shall be performed by state governments. 
and list three is concurrent list which specifies the joint responsibilities of center and state government so in overall the central government formulates the general policies and gives directions as well as the financial aids and responsibility of implementing these policies is shared by both center and the state and as a furtherance of this policy making responsibility which has been given to the center in our constitution the government has come up with this new education policy 2020 so let us now begin the discussion on the provisions of national education policy 2020 dealing with the school education sector now first and foremost it is important to know that this policy aims for universalization of education but this universalization of education is not new you already know that through rd the education has been universalized but that is the school education but a watershed moment in India's education scenario is that this particular policy will aim to universalize education from preschool to secondary level with 100% gross enrollment ratio by 2030. By attempting to achieve this, National Education Policy 2020 will bring 2 crore out of school children back into the mainstream through open schooling system. Also, the national education policy is going to replace the current curricular structure which is based on 10 plus 2 setup. So you can say that current curriculum is fragmented into two parts till class 10 standard and then 11th and 12th. But now the government is going to break down this curricular structure into four parts which will be named as 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. The first five years shall be 3 to 8 years. Next 3 years will be 8 to 11, then 11 to 14 and finally 14 to 18 years respectively. Now the rationale given by the government is that this will bring hitherto uncovered age group of 3 to 6 years under the school curriculum, which has been recognized globally as the most crucial stage for development of mental faculties of child. Now you might ask that what about the initial preschool education where that shall be given and that shall be given in Aganwadi centers which have already been opened up by the government. Now under this new curriculum there is going to be few foundational changes in the way we educate our children. Now if you are reading newspaper you must be following the reports on education released by an NGO called Pratham and the reports are known as Asar. And you must have seen that how the students of class 5 were not able to solve the mathematics and vocabulary questions of class 2. Which means that there is a lot of deficit in our educational achievement. And hence, under the new education policy, a special emphasis shall be laid on foundational literacy as well as numeracy. So now you can see that how actions of non-governmental organizations impacts the functions of the government. Because had it not been for the rigorous and the serious attempts made at formulating these reports, our government policy making would not have focused on the foundational numeracy and literacy. Also, the government is going to do away with the rigid separation between academic, extracurricular as well as vocational streams in schools. And vocational education will be started from class 6 in all the schools along with the internships. Now continuous evaluation as well as the training of teachers is equally important and hence National Curriculum Framework for Teacher Education or NCFTE 2021 will be formulated by NCTE which will be done in consultation with NCERT and the idea is that by 2030 the minimum degree qualification for teaching will be a four year integrated BA degree. And one of the highlighting features of this particular policy dealing with the school education is its emphasis on the language of instruction and that shall be mother tongue which will be made compulsory for instruction method for teaching up to at least grade 5. And also the national education policy clearly highlights that no language will be imposed on any student. So now you can understand that how important was the inclusion of these issues into national education policy. Of course, not only these steps will enable better learning outcomes for our children, but at the same time, they are going to go a long way in assuaging the doubts of a lot of regional political parties. So these are the important provisions dealing with the reforms which has to be brought about in school education through NEP 2020. This next news item, 4-year UG courses in and fill out in new education policy appears on page number 1 and it talks about the reforms which have been brought in national education policy 2020 in the field of higher education. So let us now discuss these provisions. 
Under higher education sector, the government wants to increase gross enrollment ratio to 50% by 2035. And for that, 3.5 crore seats are to be added in our higher education sector. Now, one of the long-standing problem of higher education in India has been its rigidity as well as lack of creativity in higher education. Now, all the viewers are either in later stages of their undergraduation or might have passed them. And you know that in most of the colleges and universities in our country, how difficult it is to pursue multidisciplinary courses. Taking a simple example, how difficult it is for a person to pursue few of the courses in medical as well as taking other credits from legal field or from LLB courses. You can obviously understand that it is unthinkable. But you can also at the same time understand that if we want to have world-class lawyers and legal professionals, it is important that they be allowed this kind of freedom. So now the higher education policy has taken the first steps towards what we are talking about. The policy envisages broad-based, multidisciplinary, holistic undergraduate education with flexible curriculum, which will allow for creative combinations of subjects, as well as it will allow for integration of vocational education. Apart from that, it is going to allow for multiple entry as well as exit points into our higher education system. Now to make this point clear, you know that for entry into any kind of academic stream, you need to have certain level of qualification. For example, if you want to pursue technology, you have to have maths as one of your majors in your higher secondary. Or for example, if you want to pursue a certain course in postgraduate, you have to have similar or related undergraduate degree in order to be able to pursue that. So what that does is that it creates a tunnel where if you have taken an entry at certain point, only then you can achieve that destination. Whereas all the people who have missed this particular entry then will be devoid of any kind of opportunity in this field. And hence the government is going to enable multiple entry as well as exit points. Also, the government has come up with a very, very innovative idea of academic bank of credits, which shall be established to facilitate transfer of credits. Now first and foremost, this is going to be a digital bank. Now you might ask a question that why is this particular bank is needed? Let's say if a person is pursuing her BA from a particular institute known by the name of I and under the new education policy, the transfer of the courses have been allowed from institute I1 to the second university I2. And if this person A wants to take a transfer from this particular institute to the another, what about the kind of courses as well as the credit that she has earned already in the I1? And this bank will take care of all her higher education credits into one particular bank which she can demonstrate anywhere across the country or even the world and which shall be taken into account while her final degree is being made. So this is quite a novel concept and it should be welcomed by all of us. Now, government has also announced in the national education policy of creation of an apex body for fostering a strong research culture and building research capacity across higher education. And that shall be known by the name of National Research Foundation. Obviously, you can now understand that why this was done. Now, because India's higher education institutions lag a lot when it comes to research and education creation. Most of our higher education centers work satisfactorily as far as the propagation of education is concerned. They impart education quite well, but when it comes to creating new knowledge, they lag a lot. And hence, the National Research Foundation is going to take care of all those things. And then finally, the most important topic is Higher Education Commission of India. The NEP paves the way for a single overarching regulator for higher education, which will replace UGC and All India Council for Technical Education. Now this single regulator, which will be called Higher Education Commission of India, will have four independent verticals to carry out the functions of regulator that shall be known by the name of National Higher Education Regulatory Council. Next vertical shall be about standard setting which shall be known by the name of General Education Council. Then Higher Education Grants Council shall handle the function of funding and National Accreditation Council shall fulfill the task of accreditation. Now if you are following current affairs, you must know that there is a draft Higher Education Commission of India repeal of University Grants Commission Act 1956 Bill 2018 which is already under consideration. So a lot of students ask doubt related to policy acts and bills. 
Now you can understand that policy is like a framework which gives the direction but it does not have any kind of legal backing behind it. And after the policy has been laid out, various acts and executive orders are given out by the government to actually implement various provisions of the policy. The national education policy will also do away the distinction between private and public sector colleges as far as regulation, standard setting and accreditation is concerned. Of course, there will remain differences in funding and finally other provisions also. Starting with National Educational Technology Forum, which shall be an autonomous body which will be created to provide a platform for free exchange of ideas on the use of technology to enhance learning, assessment, planning and administration. Now next, Gender Inclusion Fund is very very important and also very innovative. National Education Policy 2020 emphasizes setting up of Gender Inclusion Fund as well as Special Education Zones for disadvantaged regions and groups. What it will do, how these provisions shall be utilized will become clear in successive days as more and more details emerge out of National Education Policy 2020. And finally, and easily one of the most debatable provision which has been included in this particular policy is that it paves the way for entry of foreign university into our country. Although the foreign education institutions regulation of entry and operation bill was laid down in the parliament in 2010 and since then this topic has been in news. Now the national education policy states that the world's top 100 universities shall be facilitated to operate in the country through a new law. So obviously the government must have planned for a new law which shall enable the entry of foreign universities in our campus. And you are going to see a lot of editorials appearing in the Hindu in coming days on matters which will support this provision as well as oppose this provision. So get ready to make extensive notes on these topics. So this is it as far as the discussion on National Education Policy 2020 is concerned. All these notes shall be provided in the PDF in the form of screenshot. Try to memorize them, especially the constitutional provisions and the key features of National Education Policy 2020. The next article which we have taken has appeared on page number one. ED searches fintech firms in loan app case. So the Enforcement Directorate conducted searches at six locations in Bengaluru linked to Razorpay Private Limited, Cash Free Payments, Paytm Payment Services Limited and entities controlled or operated by suspects based in China. Now all of us know that Enforcement Directorate is the implementing agency of Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Money laundering or the process of conversion of dirty money into the clean money is a grave cause of concern for all the countries across the globe. Now if you look at the UPSC syllabus under GS Paper 3, money laundering and its prevention has been given as a part of your syllabus under internal security. Because first and foremost, money laundering is generated more often than not from illicit or illegal acts. For example, drug trafficking, arms smuggling, criminal activities like extortion money. And so all these things together have direct impact on India's internal security and the way these money laundering and the proceeds of money laundering is utilized then again become a cause for concern because a person obtaining his or her wealth or revenue from illicit sources ultimately is going to focus upon them and so more often than not money laundering becomes the base for terrorist financing and organized crime networks and that is why it is very very important for us to understand what money laundering is what are the processes and means to conduct money laundering what are its impact and what are the challenges now there is one very important aspect which we will not take up today which deals with the act or the Prevention of Money Laundering Act because it has been taken up already in the DNS. As far as previous year questions are concerned, in 2013 UPSC had asked, money laundering poses a serious security threat to a country's economic sovereignty. What is its significance for India and what steps are required to be taken to control this menace? Then in 2018, UPSC had asked India's proximity to two of the world's biggest illicit opium growing states has enhanced her internal security concerns. Explain the linkages between drug trafficking and other illicit activities such as gun running, money laundering and human trafficking. What countermeasures should be taken to prevent the same? So let us now begin the discussion. Starting with what actually is money laundering? So money laundering is a process that criminals use in an attempt to hide the illegal source of their income. 
what they basically do is that they pass their illegally obtained asset and money through complex transfers and transactions or through a series of businesses and in that process the money is cleaned so the black money is made as an input and what you have as an output is clean money which can then be utilized just like all other clean money without any government restrictions or regulations the word laundering comes from infamous gangster al capano's practice of using a chain of laundromats he owned to launder huge amounts of cash and from there the word or the term money laundering has been derived so as far as what is concerned we understand it is a process of converting dirty money or money derived from illegitimate sources into clean source of money on which no objection can be raised from the government and to just to give you an example let's say there is a person a who earns a lot of money crores and crores of uh, rupees from let's say drug trafficking now the obvious problem is that this person a cannot deposit this amount into his or her bank account simply because the income tax department and the government is going to ask questions as to what is the source of the money and the person a will not be able to explain this source of a money and so instead of directly depositing this amount into the bank what this person a can do is that it can parallelly run a hotel of let's say 10 rooms out of which on an average 3 to four rooms are occupied and six other rooms are left vacant in general so the average revenue which this hotel is generating every day is just from four rooms and six rooms are unoccupied so this person a can divert this illegitimate cash and show to the government that all the 10 rooms were occupied throughout the year and so the dirty money is mixed with the clean money and now the revenue from the hotel can be easily deposited in the bank account as a form of revenue from a hotel which is a legitimate source and then it becomes a white money so you can see that through this process person a was able to convert the illegitimate source of money into clean money which then can be utilized for any purpose because now under the system under the government radar it is accounted as a money from the hotel or profits from the hotel business but actually 60% of that revenue has come from illegitimate sources so this is a very very simplistic idea as to how money laundering works so why is money laundering done money laundering is done for two reasons either the source of income is illegal or illegitimate for example drug trafficking and various other criminal activities but does money laundering is used by only criminals or not other people of course it is used by other people as well because even if their source of income is not illegitimate for example professionals it could be doctors builders it could be businessmen all those people who have the source of income as legitimate but because of the high taxes or because their unwillingness to pay the taxes to the government they do not show their full income and rather divert these incomes derived from the legitimate sources and adopt a very complex financial procedure to evade taxes so these are the two cases where money laundering is often resorted to now the obvious question is how the money laundering is done and from the perspective of civil service examination it is important to have a brief idea about the three process or three stages adopted in money laundering and they are known as initial placement then layering and then final integration now in order to better understand these three steps let us take this example through a diagram the first step placement which we just discuss is about collection of the dirty money it is the riskiest step where launderers insert the money into formal financial channel because after all banks are required to report large transactions and these are huge piles of cash and as we understood that first it will be placed just like the example we talked about earlier it was all about inserting that black money into hotel revenue making it look like it is a legitimate source of money then the second step is layering which involves sending the money through various financial transactions to change its form and make it difficult to trace so for example bank to bank transfer international transactions investment into shell companies donation to political parties 
sending it to the accounts offshore purchasing high value items all these things are done in the second layer just to make it extremely difficult for the law enforcement agencies for the income tax department to trace back the original source of money and then finally integration money re-enters the system and now it appears to come from legitimate sources which is then most often than not involved in purchasing of luxury assets property creating trusts and receive donations through it in the future now there are various means to achieve money laundering you must have heard terms like shell companies hawala transactions round tripping so what does these term actually mean so now we understand that any kind of black money initially cannot be moved through institutional banking channels it's impossible you have to first place them layer them and then finally once it is integrated that it can move through formal banking system without any threat but before that all that cash has to be moved and that process in india is called as hawala transactions where funds are moved between individuals for example a to b from one city to another without actually physically transferring cash from place a to place b so for example if i have a lot of black money in mumbai i contact the havaldar that's why the name hawala in mumbai give him 1 crore rupees and let's say if i transfer the money to delhi within next 5 minutes person a is going to call person b who is the havaldar of delhi and that person is going to distribute exactly same amount in delhi in next 5 minute very less amount of charge so you can understand that this process is extremely convenient not only this transaction has evaded the scrutiny of the government it has also saved a lot of tax and it was done in 5 minute for amount which was massive and these amounts which havaldar's deals can go up to thousands of crores there is no physical transaction of cash between a and b because when the cash is being transferred from mumbai to delhi similarly there will be another person who would want to transfer the cash from delhi to mumbai and so this process is extremely convenient then bulk cash smuggling just like drug smuggling carrying the huge piles of cash which is what is caught during the times of elections in cars in other kinds of vehicles then the process is round tripping which is worth understanding where the money leaves the country through various channels such as inflated invoices payments to shell companies overseas or even hawala route internationally then that money is invested in shell companies and other assets in foreign country and then those assets come to india those money come back to india as an investment from those shell companies into india share market and this is what is known as round tripping so black money goes to a shell company in let's say cayman island which is a tax haven now that cayman island company is going to invest into various companies in india making it look like a foreign investment but actually it is an illegitimate money obtained from operations in india then of course gambling no need for me to explain and then finally shell companies which are businesses that have large amounts of financing but are not directly involved in any specific business enterprise selling goods or services and that's why the name shell they just have paperwork they do not have any real functioning or operation and these finances are used to invest in other businesses which are typically legitimate now of course uh, money laundering has proven to be a menace for the society economy and uh, there have to be proper reasons because once illicitly earned money enters into a particular economy's financial system it has the ability to destabilize the economic system and indirectly promote negative social and legal ills such as tax evasion which basically means loss of revenue to the government so as far as primary impact of money laundering on economy is concerned tax evasion loss of revenue to the government are the two directly we can think of but then there are legal impacts of money laundering as well for example money laundering and criminal activities form a vicious cycle the quest to legalize illicitly earned money leads to money laundering which in turn provides the required financial boost or the initial capital for further illegal activities as well as it incentivizes a lot of people to take up violence to take up crime because they have seen other people getting filthy rich as a result of money laundering 
and so it threatens law and order of that particular city country or state then it has of course social impact as well because money laundering is directly associated with high level of drug addiction in that particular society because there is a lot of wealth which is unaccounted for and so more often than not that wealth is utilized in drug addiction and then it leads to declining law abidance because law abiding citizens lose the incentive lose the motive to follow the law because they see that all those people who are breaking the law are enjoying their lives while they are making their lives miserable by following the law so this is a big problem so since legal provisions related to prevention of money laundering act has already been covered we are going to take up the challenges because of which the governments across the globe are trying to fight and control the money laundering but they are not very effective and one of the biggest reason behind that is rapid advancements in digital technology the enforcement agencies are not able to match up the speed with which the digital technology and digital financing is enabling the money launderers to obscure the origin and proceeds of crime and especially by utilizing the cyber finance techniques then another important reason because of which it is becoming an increasing challenge is non fulfillment of the purpose of know your customer norms or kyc norms increasing competition in the market is forcing the banks to lower their guards and thus facilitate the money launderers to make illicit use of the banking transactions and channels in the process of money laundering because after all banks also need businesses they need rich wealthy clients and in that process if they feel that this transaction is going to yield them some benefit they lower their guards providing an avenue for money laundering then the tax haven countries they have long been associated with money laundering because their strict financial secrecy laws allows the creation of anonymous accounts while prohibiting the disclosure of financial information and of course last but not the least is lack of awareness about seriousness of crimes of money laundering the poor and illiterate people instead of going through lengthy paperwork transaction in banks prefer the hawala system where there are fewer formalities no or little documentation and lower rates and of course anonymity now we shall take up this explained article on mission artemis destination moon and beyond although the destination of mission artemis is moon but the implication of success of this mission will go way beyond moon to other planets like mars and even outside the solar system for a planned human mission nasa's artemis mission plans to enable human landing on moon by beginning of 2024 and it targets a sustainable lunar exploration by 2028 but for now the plan is to send first woman and a first man of color to the lunar surface to the south pole of moon by 2024 but the mission will happen in stages artemis 1 this involves uncrewed flight apart from other things it will basically test the orion spacecraft that will be used to send the astronauts to the surface of the moon orion spacecraft is a advanced spacecraft of nasa to send human mission into the deep space it has many advanced facilities and obviously it is heavier so it requires a new powerful launch vehicle the most advanced launch vehicle in the world is the nasa's space launch system just like we have pslv gslv they have named their launch vehicle as space launch system sls so artemis 1 will basically be the technology demonstration of all the equipments and the spacecraft and rockets and engine and the fuel technology among other things they will be tested but that's not all in the process artemis 1 will put up many satellites cubesats in the space for various testing purposes following artemis 1 artemis 2 will be sent to the space this will be the first crewed flight it will test the entire system with the crew but the astronauts will not be sent to the lunar surface yet the crewed mission in artemis 2 will go into the space into the lower earth orbits but it will not go to the lunar surface landing on lunar surface will happen through artemis 3 that should happen around 2024 but for all that it's crucial extremely essential that artemis 1 works out well it is not just about human beings again after 1969 landing on the surface of the moon 
but it is about developing capability of sending human beings into space not just on moon on mars beyond our solar system conduct experiments that was not even thought to be possible to be done on a spacecraft and who knows the possibility of meeting aliens so artemis 1 is about laying the foundation for more complex and ambitious human missions it's a very complex mission that will build on the aspiration of having human presence for a long term on the surface of the moon conduct experiments for decades to come when artemis 1 will be launched it will be carrying several payloads in the form of small satellites generally in the form of cubesats each of these cubesats will be equipped with instruments meant for some specific investigations and experiments all these experiments will help the long term stay of human beings in space and on the lunar surface there are several cubesats one of the cubesats will do mapping of water in all forms on the surface of the moon and also into the deeper space there is another cubesat that will map the availability of hydrogen that can be utilized as source of energy then there are other cubesats that will be performing biological experiments investigating the behavior of small organisms like fungi and algae how do these microorganisms behave in outer space how does the radiation affect them how are the gene of these microorganisms altered because of that all these things will be studied that will help us to plan human mission in the longer term into deeper space and to enable such missions nasa's orion spacecraft has been planned orion will serve as the exploration vehicle that will carry a crew of a space providing emergency abort capability as well sustaining the crew during the space travel and also provide safe reentry from deep space back on the earth this time in the artemis 1 mission orion spacecraft will be used and it will have three dummy passengers these dummy passengers would be made up of materials that mimic human bones and skin and the soft tissues and internally it will be planted with host of sensors to record various impacts of deep space atmosphere on human body because of the facilities that will be provided by orion spacecraft obviously you understand that it will be heavier and hence it require a more powerful rocket for the launch and that is a space launch system artemis mission will be launched by sls it is the most powerful ever built rocket more powerful than saturn 5 rockets Saturn V rockets if you know were used for Apollo mission to the moon it is a gigantic rocket 98 meter tall it will weigh around 2500 ton and it will take the mission directly to the moon the mission will not have gravity assisted motion although the assistance of gravity will be used at particular instance but the rocket itself will be taking the mission directly to the moon So with these important parts of the mission the primary goal of Artemis 1 is to demonstrate Orion's spacecraft capability in the space flight environment and ensure a safe reentry a safe descent and the successful recovery of the spacecraft after the launch the spacecraft will orbit the earth and deploy its solar arrays then the interim cryogenic propulsion stage it will give orion a push to help it leave earth's orbit and travel towards earth's only natural satellite the moon then within about 2 hours from launch time when the spacecraft is on a trajectory to the moon it will separate from icps the interim cryogenic propulsion stage when it separates from the spacecraft the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will deploy small satellites the cubesats that we have been talking about these cubesats will go on their journey into the deep space then on its path to the moon orion spacecraft will be propelled by a service module built by the european space agency apart from supplying the spacecraft's propulsion system and power the service module is also designed to house air and water for future crewed mission once the mission enters into the moon's orbit the spacecraft will collect data Afterwards Orion will use a precisely timed engine firing of the service module in combination with the moon's gravity to accelerate back towards the earth it will travel through the earth's atmosphere and will have if everything goes right a safe landing off the coast of San Diego California in the Pacific Ocean
So now you understand the heart and soul of Artemis mission is that the mission will go to the moon and then will come back. But going to the moon, we have done that already. About half a century back, NASA already sent astronauts on the surface of the moon. Then why NASA is spending around $100 billion on this mission? Why we are landing on the moon again? Because astronauts have landed on the moon, they have brought back the collection of rocks, and that has appended our knowledge about the planetary science a lot. The radioactive analysis of the isotopes in the rock material has provided us with the precise information on the age of the moon's surface. The rocks has revealed to us the story of formation of moon and it appears to have formed out of the debris ejected into the space when Mars-sized objects slammed into the Earth around 4.5 billion years ago. We have already these first-hand direct information from the Apollo mission of 1969. And after that, it was thought that the moon was a very dry, inhabitable place and the attention of NASA and other space agencies drifted away from the moon towards planets like Mars. But you see, Apollo mission was the result of geostrategic consideration. The Soviet Union already advanced considerably. They had a considerable lead in space technology over US. And after the Sputnik mission, there was a lot of pressure on the United States to have a mission of their own. So Apollo mission, in a sense, was also ahead of its time. It was hugely hurried. This mission was launched only 12 years after the first satellite was launched into the space. So the technological advancement was not enough to explore the moon sufficiently back then. After the Apollo mission, there has been huge progress in space exploration. We have sent spacecraft that goes well beyond the solar system. We have sent exploration mission to Jupiter, to Mars, to Saturn, to Venus, to Pluto. More than 500 astronauts have traveled to space and back. We formed permanent space laboratories in International Space Station. So we have made huge progress in space exploration. And with the benefit of these advancements, Artemis mission will be much more powerful than the Apollo mission. Recently, we have understood that moon is not as dry as it was thought initially before further missions to the moon were abandoned. Through various missions, including Chandrayaan mission, we know that water is there. Water frozen at the bottom of eternally dark craters at the pole, they are a valuable resource. It can provide not only drinking water for future astronauts visiting the moon, water can also be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen can be used as fuel. The ices in these craters they are of ancient accumulation several billion years ago. So they are our scientific history book of the solar system. We have made huge technological achievement in the space exploration and space-based science that will help generation of oxygen. You must be aware of MOXIE experiment that is being carried out by the Perseverance mission on Mars. There the effort is going on to create oxygen from methane and carbon monoxide. We have made very advanced spectrometer. In Chandrayaan 2, there's a spectrometer called as CLASS, Large Area Soft X-ray Spectrometer. And because of these very advanced spectrometers, we know more about the moon than we previously did. We know that there's a streak of sodium on the moon. Now we know of the presence of minor elements on moon like manganese and chromium. We also know of the presence of argon in the exosphere of the moon and this argon perhaps comes from potassium which implies that some radioactivity is going on beneath the surface of the moon and that information will help us a lot to understand about the crust and the structure of the moon. Above everything, we know of the presence of helium-3 and you know how important this is. Helium-3 can be used in fusion technology to create enormous amount of energy. So much so that all the problem of energy crisis on Earth will be solved. All the villages can be electrified. Energy intensive process like purification of water can be carried out easily. And now you will appreciate the effort of Artemis 1 to make it a mission that will swing around the moon and come back, do a safe landing. There will be recovery of spacecraft on Earth. Because if we can do that, we can bring back resources from moon, not only helium-3 
there are rare earth minerals there as well and that is why it has become a geostrategic reason to accelerate the effort in making this immensely complicated mission a success. In the press conference, the NASA's director revealed that the advancement of China in this regard, for instance, China has successfully landed three robotic missions on the moon and other countries are also making their effort like India and one from Israel. They both sent landers in 2019, although it was not a success, but there's a South Korean orbiter on its way and even countries like UAE are making efforts to send missions to the moon. But the point here is that China has successfully sent robotic mission on the moon. They have a lander there and they'll bring back the sample. So it shouldn't be the case that China start dominating this space. And NASA clearly said that it shouldn't be the case that China starts saying don't come here because it belongs to me, because this space belongs to us. Everyone in the geostrategic sphere wants to have the advantage of the first mover. So remember, that's also one very important dimension. It's not just about science. It's not just about resource exploration, but it is also about having a geostrategic edge. That's why NASA has pumped in so much money into the mission. That's why so much of focus globally given to this mission. There is an explained article based on the plea for contempt of court action against Kapil Sibyl. But that request has been denied by the AG. Because the permission of the AG is required in case of criminal court of content proceedings. What you need to know is this. First of all, under the Article 129 of Indian Constitution, Supreme Court shall be the court of record and shall have all powers of such a court. Court of record basically means that the court has the power to punish for contempt of itself. And from here, this Article 129 of the Constitution this gives the power to the courts to punish for its contempt. But the details are not there in the article as to how and the manner and the way in which the punishment will be given. That comes from Contempt of Court Act 1971. Contempt of Court Act 1971 defines civil contempt and criminal contempt. Civil contempt refers to willful disobedience of an order of any court. And criminal contempt include scandalizing the court. Scandalizing meaning giving attributes, motives to the intent and action of the court. It also includes prejudices to any judicial proceedings. And this is exactly where the contempt of court can be initiated, if at all. Because he is giving his prejudices against the judicial proceedings. Criminal contempt also include interference with the administration of justice in any other manner. Now this phrase is very open-ended and that is why the power of contempt of court must be used very sparingly because anything and everything obliquely can be covered under this. The further detail as to how the proceedings against civil or criminal contempt can be initiated that is not there in the Contempt of Courts Act 1971. That is rather in the Rules to Regulate Proceedings for Contempt of the Supreme Court 1975. And in this rule, we find how the proceedings against someone for criminal contempt can be initiated. The rule says, in case of contempt other than the contempt referred to in Rule 2. In Rule 2 actually, the contempt which is talked about, that is against the proceedings of the court. And the contempt against the proceedings of the court will amount to civil contempt. So what we are talking about here is criminal contempt. In case of contempt, other than the contempt referred to in Rule 2, the court may take action somoto or on a petition made by Attorney General or Solicitor General or on a petition made by any person. And in case of a criminal contempt with the consent in writing of Attorney General or Solicitor General. Two things you must bear in mind if you are initiating criminal contempt against someone, only in that case you require consent in writing of Attorney General or Solicitor General. And secondly, you must understand it is not an either or choice that you go to either Attorney General or Solicitor General. You can go to Solicitor General only if Attorney General is not available. For example, in the Sora Bhaskar case, Attorney General declined to give the consent to initiate criminal contempt. Then the petitioner went to Solicitor General. In that case, it was clarified, Solicitor General being a junior officer to Attorney General cannot overrule the decision of Attorney General. 
all right so it is not either or it is solicitor general only if attorney general is not available to give the consent but most importantly what you must remember from this slide if a person is initiating criminal contempt against someone in that case a consent in writing is required from attorney general or solicitor general See, judiciary is an important institution, no doubt, and its dignity cannot be undermined. However, there is a question of principle of whether one has right to criticize the judiciary based on certain facts or definite facts or not. Every citizen has the right of his independent view. If somebody says judges are corrupt, allow him the opportunity to prove his allegation right. Judges are human. They can be corrupt. If he or she is found to be completely scandalous, then punish him or her, but not before that. One cannot be punished without giving a chance to prove his allegation. The authority and dignity of Supreme Court as an institution will be enhanced if it addresses the allegation, rather than to impose contempt on the person who made them on basis of facts. So all in all, a chance to present your case must be given. You must be allowed to prove your allegation. Punishment cannot be given just for raising questions.